Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. So um, I guess I'll uh, sort of give the first half of the talk on some new uh, genome editing technologies we've been working on, and then I'll pass it to Jonathan in the chat about some of the uh, RNA uh, technology work we've been doing. So um, yeah, just to dive in, let me try to share my screen. Um, hopefully that's coming through. Um, cool. Yeah, so just to dive in, um, you know, I think uh, you've heard uh, a lot about this in the in probably the previous talks, but uh, you know, gene editing is obviously reaching a really uh, great uh, sort of level of maturity as we're starting to see uh, drugs progress to the clinic. Um, you know, there's uh, of course right both uh, the CRISPR therapeutics uh, verte and vertex drug for for sort of blood disorders like sickle cell disease, as well as um, Intellia's and Vivo drug, but you know. Despite you know this progress, we have you know two sort of you know human cures um, on the frontier. There's still uh, you know millions of actual pathogenic variants if you actually look in Climbar, and so um, that long tail of you know how are we actually going to build now drugs for these remaining mutations really intrigues us. And so um, you know a lot of what we've been thinking about is how can we start. Uh, building uh, technologies that allow us to more practically go after the 7,000 genetic diseases and not go necessarily mutation by mutation. Um, and so, and conversely, um, you know, doing this in a way that maybe isn't just using sort of DNA editing and DNA targeting, but also RNA editing and RNA writing technologies that we'll talk about today as well, that could uh, potentially uh, solve these uh, sort of challenges. Um, and in some cases can actually be easier to deliver. Um, and so, you know, that's on, on sort of the genome editing front. I think another interesting space um, that we've also been thinking about is kind of in the single cell field, sort of how, you know, genome editing tools were kind of driven by this necessity of genome sequencing and starting to understand genetic variants that drive disease. With the single cell field, we're now starting to understand how cells and cell states drive disease, but we don't have a similar programmable toolbox to perturb cell states, like by recognizing RNA markers and, and you know, upregulating or downregulating cell states. And so we'll also talk about technologies that are addressing that um, new challenge as we see it. So our group really, you know, develops technologies and applications across, you know, the DNA and RNA editing spaces, you know, cell sensing and single cell technologies, as well as cell reprogramming delivery. And today we'll sort of talk about projects in the first two buckets. So uh, to dive in on our on sort of the first technology I want to talk about, uh, which is sort of large gene insertion and large gene replacement. Um, and so while, you know, we've heard about the really amazing advances in sort of you know, cast nucleases and, you know, next generation versions of those like base editors and prime editors, those still fundamentally all target, you know, mutations or small stretches of, of the genome, like, you know, maybe 30 to 50, in some cases, a couple hundred bases. Um, and so when we were setting out, to, uh, you know, when we started our lab, I guess, four or five years ago, um, you know, it, we really felt like the sort of large insertions were the kind of thing that we're missing. Yes, you could do it with HDR, not from all this end joining, um, but there wasn't really good enzymatic approaches that uh, worked regardless of DNA repair and cell cycling um, in human cells. Um, and the reason for this, which I hinted at before, is there's millions of, you know, variants in people. Um, 7,000 genetic diseases, and a lot of those diseases have dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of mutations. And so going mutation by mutation is not really going to develop a cure for everyone. Um, and so uh, we came up with a technology um, called PASTE that uh, sort of allowed us to marry the advances with Cas9 and reverse transcriptases, aka prime editing, with um, you know some of the power of enzymes like recombinases, large serine recombinases, integrases. Um, and by fusing the benefits of both those types of approaches, we could actually make a programmable technology that could insert tens of thousands of base pairs. Um, the fundamental limitation with integrases is they're not reprogrammable. They're really hard to change their target site, but luckily their target site's only you know, 30 to 40 base pairs. And so that's perfect for a prime editing-like system to lay that site in the genome, which you can then insert um, directly into after. Um, and so we developed different versions of PASTE, um, you know, where we tested a lot of, you know, different types of linkers and whether the integrate should be attached or um, separated. Um, and this is a version called PASTE v3 um, that, you know, across different sizes of payloads at two different sites could actually insert semi-efficiently in, in human cells and even up to 36,000 bases, um, where the limitation doesn't really become the insertion size, but actually how do you deliver 36,000 bases to a cell, um, which is a little difficult. <clears throat> 
We also compared paste um, across different endogenous sites to non homologous end joining insertion, uh, sometimes called HIDI. Um, and even on validated HIDI sites, we were getting better efficiency. Um, I don't have time to go into the fidelity of insertion, um, but you can check out the paper. But also paste because it's a dual nicking approach is really high fidelity versus these other, you know, like HIDI and HDR, which have a lot of indels. Um, and lastly, um, one other thing I just want to highlight is we were able to package this system into adenoviruses. This is three different adenoviruses, but we were able to demonstrate in humanized liver mice, um, you know, levels of insertion that were, you know, low in the one to two and a half percent, but um, demonstrate that this approach can insert genes. And in the paper, you can also look at our indels, which are almost non-existent here. Um, whereas if you try to do HDR in vivo, you get like 30, 40 percent indels and very little insertion. So, um, and, you know, for future work, we're actually now trying to develop LMP versions of this technology that um, don't require a virus, as well as continue to engineer both integrases and other types of transposases um, for even higher efficiency gene replacement. Um, so that's on PACE. Um, one other quick story I want to talk about is, um, you know, continuing to uh, discover new programmable nucleases. Um, so, you know, we've spent a lot of time over the past nine, 10 years trying to uncover what is beyond Cas9 in terms of uh, enzymatic diversity. And we've really gone all over, you know, trying to uncover, you know, things like Cas12, Cas13, um, and many different types of, of variants of Cas12s. Um, and, but, you know, one thing that really intrigued us um, over the past few, you know, few years was where these CRISPR systems came from. And there was, of course, a really awesome paper by Fung and Six, uh, Sixness's lab um, where they show that CRISPR systems come from TMPBs, um, which are like these really abundant transposase uh, systems um, across, you know, all bacteria. And, um, and um, what was interesting is there was a paper from 2013 that we had come across that found TMPB like enzymes actually in eukaryotes called fanzors. Um, and it, it was kind of a computational paper that never really um, you know, knew what they were doing. So after the TMPB, TMPB papers, we wondered whether these were actually RNA guided nucleases that had spread to you know, the eukaryotic tree of life. Um, and so we, you know, investigated this and actually found we expanded um, the number of fans systems a hundredfold by doing computational searches and were able to find um, these systems and all, you know, fungi, plants, amoeba, amoeba um, animals even. So, you know, they really had spread across the entire tree. Um, and we actually studied uh, a couple of them. So one of them was uh, from giant viruses. They're also in eukaryotic viruses, which are these viruses that have megabase scale genomes. We uh, isolated uh, one of the systems and showed it was expressed. Um, and actually that that expression had a non-coding RNA that was downstream of the, of the nucleus. And we also took these nucle uh, multiple nucleases and showed that across different endogenous sites in human ge uh, genome that they indeed caused indels due to programmable RNA guided uh, nucleus activity. Um, I mean, there's also a lot of interesting biology, evolutionary biology in our, in our manuscript, and also showing that these things evolved like exons and NLS sequences to actually invade the eukaryotic nucleus, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, additionally, um, that, you know, there's many variants that are functional, like from the Japanese mud cell, an algae variant, a zebra mussel variant, as well as a clam variant. Um, and so uh, we're very excited to continue following these up and also, you know, study their, what they're doing in eukaryotic hosts, especially uh, given their strong association with transposases. Um, so on that note, I will um, pass it on to Jonathan to talk about some of our RNA um, writing uh, work. So. So thanks so much for the introduction um, from Omar on some DNA technologies. And now I'll be able to chat a little bit about some new RNA technologies as well. So one question, of course, is how do we discover and engineer new RNA nucleases? And so when we started our lab, we were interested in discovering new CRISPR proteins outside of the traditional Cas9 uh, archetype. And we actually looked to a system called the type 3 systems, including type 3D and type 3E. Now, type 3 systems are often multi-different proteins. Proteins. Here you can see the type 3D systems, for example, involve a, a Cas7X3 and a Cas7 protein. Those two work in concert. Um, most type 3 systems actually have multiple Cas7 proteins. And one interesting thing is we actually found for this type 3E system, um, which we called Cas711 because it has multiple Cas7-like do domains fused together um, and a Cas711 uh, domain, we actually found that this, as a single protein, could actually be expressed and uh, used as an RNA targeting protein. So just to illustrate that, we purified Cas711 in co uh, collaboration with Eugene Kunin, and we found that we could actually get precise targeting in vitro um, 
both with a five and three prime labeled construct. And then we can actually tile guides along the construct um, to find different areas of targeting. So you can see we were tiling CRISPR RNAs um, from one end to the other, and we can see that cut site move across the protein, uh, sorry, across the RNA um, if, on that gel. So does this work in mammalian cells? Yes. So we actually were able to reconstitute it in mammalian cells uh, and compared it to other RNA targeting CRISPR systems like the uh, CAS13s. And we found that in uh, for two uh, mRNA transcripts and one non-coding transcript, uh, it could actually have levels of knockdown uh, comparable or better than, in some cases, CAS13 RNA targeting system. So this works in mammalian cells as an RNA targeting system. But why is it interesting to be able to cut RNA in mammalian cells? And this actually maps to another technology that we've since built upon the CAS711 system, which we call PRECISE. So we're very interested in how we can use this RNA targeting not just to knock transcripts down, but to manipulate them. And so the PRECISE system, the way that it works is that it leverages a trans-splicing reaction. So normal splicing will be between exons. What we can do is we can actually recruit a template guide RNA, which we call a TGRNA, which involves a trans-splicing acceptor. And that splicing can actually occur between this donor and the trans-template. Now that can lead to this edited product here. Importantly, we can use Cas711 and target with its CRISPR RNA to create a specific break here that separates the normal cis exon from the upstream exon, showing uh, improving the efficiency. So this precise system actually biases towards that trans-splicing reaction. So how well does this work? We found that we could actually take precise and target multiple different areas uh, on multiple different transcripts of uh, varying expression. And we could actually target both with the wild type Cas11 as well as many different mutants, um, which we engineered. And we found that this enhanced variant that we uh, engineered in collaboration with Hiroshi Nishimasu at the University of Tokyo actually allowed us to have enhanced efficiency. And so you can see at genes such as Shank3, we can get up to 30% editing without editing the genome, but we can actually change the protein products at the RNA level. So we're very excited about the concept of using this. Now, one important thing that we actually realized during this process is that we don't actually necessarily, for some splicing reactions, even have to use Cas711. We found that for a five prime interaction where we want to replace the upstream intron, if we actually use a ribozyme to replace the poly A tail um, or excise the poly A tail, we can have high efficiency transplicing using this uh, approach. So this is a protein-free approach for RNA and nucleic acid editing. And you can see that here we can use different ribozymes and we can actually have efficiency that exceeds a Cas7 protein-based approach at two different loci. And then this actually allows us to package the entire system into a single AAV for targeting in uh, here, we're targeting uh, the Huntington's transcript. So we can actually target and remove the five prime exon, the exon one that contains the ex, uh, expanded repeats. This allows us to do an AV therapy for Huntington's here in a Hector 93 FT model. But um, we're very excited about the prospect of this being able to actually manipulate and provide a science, uh, therapeutic modality without having to uh, edit the genome at all. So we're very excited about the future of Cas7 and these RNA writing technologies and how we can continue to optimize it, as well as with these RNA therapeutic applications. Lastly, I want to talk about a little uh, how we can actually sense RNA and respond instead of editing nucleic acids. So we've talked a lot about how we can edit and manipulate nucleic acids. But one question is, how can we actually engineer cells in a similar way? And the diversity of cells, this is, of course, very important for things like modeling disease, where we want to be able to control different cell types in a disease model or eliminate disease, uh, cells to understand their function. We want to be able to actually target specific, specific uh, subsets of cells, like specific T cell populations. So, for example, regulatory T cells, how do we target those and ablate them or manipulate them? How can we control CRISPR? Uh, therapies to only act in specific cell types? And then also, how can we actually create dynamic and inducible gene therapies that only act where we want in the specific uh, place and time? So we want to be able to actually have these sorts of responses, and it really comes down to being able to sense and respond to gene expression. So we developed a system that leverages a protein ADAR to be able to do this. So this system uses ADAR, which is adenosine deaminase acting on RNA that actually is an RNA editing enzyme in, present in a, uh, a large majority of our cells. 
And the way that it works is that if you have a cell type specified by a specific transcript of RNA, we can design a region of a payload RNA that binds to that. This attracts an ADAR enzyme, and that ADAR actually comes and removes this binding region. There's a stop codon. We can edit and release that stop codon, causing protein production. So this is a programmable way that given a payload that we only want to express in a target cell that has this target transcript, we can design a stop codon containing sensor that hybridizes there and then expresses only in that context. And we call this technology radars for reprogrammable ADAR sensors. So this works quite well. You can actually see both in the absence of a supplemented ADAR and the presence of supplemented ADAR, which makes it much stronger, we have a strong differential with very, very little background. We can actually go, uh, go on a campaign to improve this technology where we actually did multiple different uh, optimizations, including the guide duplex length and in, uh, including an upstream peptide that allowed us to get over 250 fold activation from absence to presence of transcripts. And this actually is quantitative. If we compare it to transcript levels, we can uh, induce different levels of transcripts over um, uh, in a, using an inducible expression system. We can see that the radar's activation actually matches the qPCR very well. We can also do this in, uh, on endogenous genes by using siRNA, dosing siRNA up and titrating gene expression down. We can see over many different genes when we increase the siRNA going this way, we reduce the expression of the gene by qPCR, and we also reduce the expression of the gene by our radar's measurement. So we actually can track the expression that very well. Lastly, we can target things like caspases to cells to ablate them. So here we can actually uh, eliminate a cell based on its expression, and we can turn on and have massive increases in cell death. We can do a logic-based system where we can use AND gates to actually uh, by coupling radars together, we can sense two targets and create an AND gate that requires the expression of both targets to turn on expression. And then lastly, this system actually functions in vivo. So we can formulate it as a lipid nanoparticle and actually deliver it into a mouse uh, to sense, here we're sensing a specific gene and a specific uh, mouse strain, this uh, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin gene from humans. And we can see that compared to, this is a constitutive expression, this is background expression from a non-targeting sensor, two sensors that are activated and sense only this mouse, this NSGPIZ mouse, you can see they have significant activation of the mouse. So we can actually formulate this for in vivo use. So we're very excited about radars as well as a therapeutic tool, as well as a foundational tool for understanding and targeting cell types. Um, and we're actively working to improve it for applications such as cancer therapeutics, aging and autoimmune disease. So. To summarize, we're very excited about the different proteins. This is the tree of life, actually, from Jill Banfield. You know, the different proteins we can sample, both from prokaryotic diversity, such as integrases, CRISPR proteins, and eukaryotic diversity, such as FANSORs and ADARs. So we think that there's, you know, we're all just scratching the surface of how we can assemble these cell tools and then use them to understand and control cell states. So with that, we'd like to thank everybody for your attention. Um, and thank the lab. Uh, we recently moved to Harvard Medical School, of course, as you heard. Um, so we're very actively recruiting. Um, so please check out our lab website. And we'd like to thank the people who made this possible, all of our lab members and our collaborators, as well as our funding sources. So with that, um, we'd be happy to take any questions. And thank you so much for your attention.